I'd like to call to order the Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors meeting of July 16th, 2019. Certification of compliance with the open meeting law. The agenda was posted on the 12th of July at 2.30. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Roll call. All right, there are 23 supervisors present. Thank you. Approval of the June 18th, 2019 journal. Supervisor Glavin. Move to approve. Thank you, Supervisor Glavin. Is there a second? Supervisor Hebeling. I support that. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, please push your I or nay button. Motions approved unanimously. Thank you. Consideration of appointment by the county administrator. To your board of adjustments, Mark Fowler, a reappointment. Okay, we need a motion on that. Supervisor Conradi. Move we approve. Thank you, Supervisor Conradi. Supervisor Testrudi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll support the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Testrudi. Any discussion or questions? Seeing no lights, please push your I or nay button. That appointment's approved unanimously. Thank you. Presentation. Uh, we have a listen presentation. It's a video presentation regarding domestic violence. I believe Judge Persek is here to introduce it. Judge? Thank you for having me this evening. My name is Rebecca Persick. I'm a circuit court judge and I've been a judge for four years. Before that I was the court commissioner for 12 years. A lot of people don't know what the court commissioner does and I would say it's like being a junior judge. It's a good way to describe it. And so as a court commissioner, one of the things I did every day was initial appearances in criminal cases. And every day in Sheboygan County we had at least one domestic violence related case oftentimes more than one. And that really shocked me. I had no idea how prevalent it was. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as a judge and a court commissioner, I received a lot of training, and all of us do, on the effects of domestic violence on children. And I'm not talking about child abuse. I'm not talking about children who are the target of violence. I'm talking about children who are witnessing it in their homes. And those effects can be devastating, but they're not well known. Um, and so the film you're about to see brings awareness to that issue, and I think it's very important. Um, it was developed by Chloe Bone, who you see on the screen. She is a high school student, or she was, she just graduated. Um, and all through high school, she volunteered at Safe Harbor, our local domestic violence shelter. And while volunteering there, she met a lot of children exposed to violence and really wanted to help them. She developed a passion for helping them. And so she's developed this film, and in conjunction with the film, a website to bring awareness to the issue. 
I can't take any credit at all for what she's done. Um, I didn't know her before a couple months ago, but once I saw the film and saw the website, I realized how important it was, and I've shared it with as many people as I can. And to quote District Attorney Yermansky, we need to get this into the hands of children. So whatever you can do to help that in that capacity, I hope you will do. I hope you will see the value in this film and the website as well, um, because I honestly think it has the potential to save lives. And the website is unique. It's at discoverlisten.com. It's very unique because it's designed for children to use. It's not designed for adults. It's designed for children to connect them to resources and also to give them a forum to anonymously share their stories and help process what they're going through and by doing that, help offset the negative consequences. So again, thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Enjoy the film. Thank you, Judge. Hello, thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Chloe Bo, and I'm here to present a project about childhood domestic violence called Listen. Um, Listen would not be possible if not for the Innovator Fellowship Program, uh, a collaboration between Sheboygan North High School and Jake's Cafe, where a selected group of students can pursue an artistic vision through a year-long project of choice. Childhood domestic violence is when a child in the home um, witnesses domestic violence. And what you'll see in the film is that these kids, by wit just witnessing the domestic violence, the impact is just as great as if the child had been abused themselves. Four years ago, I started volunteering at Safe Harbor, um, and I have met so many children who really need help. I truly believe the first step in helping children is listening to them. So without further ado, I present to you, Listen to Me, a short film. He's out there and he's going to hurt us. 
I mean, she broke bones and stuff from him. I was so scared she would actually die. I lived with my grandma for three months until my mom got better. Three months is a long time. I missed my mom a lot. He lets me put on these really expensive headphones, so I can't hear my mom being hurt. My mom still cries sometimes and has dreams about daddy. I got to spend a lot of time with my grandma, and that made things easier. My mom's boyfriend moved out, but my mom and I still don't get along that well. I don't have a dad anymore because he was hurting us. Calling you my room and calling my favorite stuffed animal, George. And he has another monkey. His name is George, too. So he doesn't feel scared when I'm scared. Sometimes he's mean to me, too. She's worried that I'll get hurt, too. Yeah, my mom and dad fall a lot, but now we're at this place, and my mom lives here, and my dad doesn't. So they don't fight anymore. It's really scary when they fight. If I get hurt protecting my mom, I know she would do anything for me. She's my rock. Call the police. That's what I had to do. My mom's boyfriend went to jail because of it. Don't go in between the adults when you get hurt. Don't call my little mother or use your phone. That's how I got hurt one time. Really hurt. I have a scar on my wrist. I want to die, so I don't know. I don't think that's a good option, but what else is there to do to make it stop? It doesn't end. I've never been to a shelter. What is that? But often when those cases come in, the message is that the children were asleep or they didn't see or they were somewhere else. But what we find is when we do actually get those, when we do actually get those children in the door, they have seen the violence and they either have seen it on this occasion or on another one, or they've been abused themselves. Physically fights my mom and me. He hasn't hurt my little sister and brother yet though. So um, whenever there's a case, of domestic violence, we know that the people, the adults involved have children. We are always advocating that those children make it to a child advocacy center like here to have interviews, to have medical exams, to find out what they know, what they've been exposed to, and make sure that they and their bodies are safe. So a lot of times kids are told that they need to not talk to anyone about this. My stepdad threatens me not to talk about it. A lot of fearful tactics put in to them from sometimes the abuser, sometimes just the shame and guilt of the domestic abuse happening at home. The abuse. He tells me no one will believe me and that I'll just disappear. For years and years we used to think that if a child maybe didn't see or hear things that they were not impacted, we know it's actually the exact opposite. It hurts to watch. My older siblings try to protect me from seeing and hearing the abuse. Domestic violence affects all race, uh, socioeconomic status, sexual orientations, right? So it's, there's no um, look to domestic violence. All of these things. So all of these ways of growth are stuck in for them. So they're not focusing at school because they couldn't sleep last night because mom and dad were fighting and they hurt it all night. Or they can't focus at school because they're worried about mom being at home right now and what is mom going through if dad's there or the abuser's there and, and, the, the, other, and the victim is there. And you know, is mom going to be alive when I get home? Is mom going to have bruises? Is mom going to be crying when I get home? All these different things. That's what they're worried about when they're at school instead of focusing on learning. Sometimes. After school, I was scared to go home because I knew before I went to school that day that things weren't going well. And when I was at school, I was worried about my mom and my baby brothers. So you can just imagine the impact of a kid who's sitting at school all day and they're not listening, they're not paying attention, and school is not their main focus because survival is their main focus. 
I need her to stay alive. Short-term effects could be acting out behavior, um, lack of attention, um, inability to sit still, sometimes looking like ADHD. And so we know if a mama is in a domestic violence situation um, and is carrying a child, that that stress um, can become toxic, not only to her, but to her, to her unborn child. Uh, long term could be going towards homelessness, drug abuse, alcoholism, violence themselves, because if you've experienced violence many times, they also will, you know, that, that works towards their future, and that's what they know. A child's um, alarm system, if you will, becomes overactivated and um, we see, uh, you know, the fight, flight, freeze response becomes um, strong. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's it's on all the time. I'm afraid for my mom's life and my own. I regret not calling 911 that day. My mom told me to, but calling 911 with my dad. Seemed really cruel, but who else was there to help my mom that day? It was me, and I failed her. I was five. We left my dad after that day. That's when we came to the shelter. You know, communities should have places like Safe Harbor to help kids and to be able to support them in their healing journey from experiencing traumatic incidents. And so every community should have an agency like that. I think we need to support the agencies that do provide direct services. We're a county-based agency, so we're a government agency, uh, and we're required by the state statutes to provide services. But I think that the general public does not realize how much the services that work directly with crime victims, like the housing, the shelter, the advocacy, um, community-based organizations like Safe Harbor, for example, how critical they are in the services they provide. If they're not funded fully, that means the groups aren't available, the support services aren't available, people can't meet their day-to-day -day needs and deal with the trauma that they've been through. What my best uh, answer for that would be is A, to be supportive and believe them, right? So again, creating that one trusted person, creating a safe person for them to tell that to. But I'd also really provide uh, support that looks like, um, you know, I don't get to live your life. Uh, I'm not here to make decisions for you, but I want you to know that I support you and I'm here for you and I want to listen and uh, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but really just to to be an open, safe space, a safe container for that person to come to so that um, they can uh, have a safe place to fall, but then also um, what that does is allows them to continue to, to share with me safely. Um, also some other options is reporting it to the police, reporting it to CPS. Um, sometimes people, they, they can do an investigation and they can look into it. Um, also, can be very frustrated if uh, nothing comes of that. Um, from my experience, uh, sometimes they need to show a pattern of behavior, which is very frustrating. But so, if you report it once and nothing happens, don't just be discouraged by that. Continue to report as things are being told to you, and that can create a case and it can create a larger change. Who can help her? I think what you have to look at is that if it's a child that's in danger or you're concerned for child safety, you can make an anonymous referral to social services and they can by law protect your name as a reporter. So I think that's one avenue um, that does offer some insulation as far as making a report if you're concerned about a child's safety. And that's why it's made that way. I think that if you're acting in good faith, I can't, I can't comment or say legally whether there's ever any ramifications because I know someone can file a lawsuit for slander, like civilly, I work in the criminal world, but in the civil world you can file a lawsuit if you thought someone was out to slander you. Uh, but I think that you have to look at what action did you take 
what evidence did you have at the time, and were you doing it in the best knowledge of what you were trying to do in prevention or in safety? So it was it was revolutionary in that it changed the arresting procedure in domestic violence cases. It's been revised over the years, but it meant um, simply that it wasn't an officer's discretion on whether or not someone should be arrested. Um, there, if there was probable cause that a crime had committed, an arrest had to be made. So there were no more, let's let the person walk around the block and cool off, or let's go let them stay somewhere else until they um, can think clearly, or let's ask the victim if they want to press charges. It took all that off the table, and the victim no longer had to press charges. If there was a crime that had been committed, there was probable cause that a crime that had been committed, the officer had to make an arrest. Now, we have great officers um, that work really hard to get to the bottom of situations and to learn what's going on in the situation, but this gave them the mandate that they could then enforce a mandatory arrest and arrest the person that is primarily responsible for what happened. I think, um, believe them. I think listening to children and believing children is what we can all do to help keep children safe. Um, there are too many examples in my career. I've, I've interviewed over 3,000 children. I've interviewed, um, and I've been doing it about 20 years. So in that time, you know, I've seen a lot of occasions where people don't believe kids, and not just parents, but, you know, maybe investigators, maybe teachers, maybe social workers or interviewers. So I think, you know, the first thing we have to do is really listen to kids and give them a chance to tell us things. Not just how was your day, was it good, was it bad, but really saying, tell me all about what happened. And giving children a, a chance to talk about their experiences. I think that that's something that every single person can do. That doesn't cost anything, doesn't doesn't take any extra skill set. We can all start by listening. because before any other solutions can happen, people need to understand what is happening to these children. Then, the next step is looking at resources. What help is available to kids? How do we support the resources that are available? And how do we make them accessible to children? This thought process made me want to do something more than just the film. And that's why, with the help of web designers at Jake's Cafe, I created the website Discover Listen. The URL is discoverlisten.com and it is accessible to anyone as there is no login or password needed. The website has three functions. First is prevention education. Here a child can learn what domestic violence is, if they are a victim, and what to do if they are a victim. The second function is called Get Help. Here a child can see what resources are offered in their county and then find the help that is closest to them. They look at a map of Wisconsin and they can find the county and then the region that they live in. Below the map um, is each region listed with all of the resources below. So, for example, if I'm a child living in Sheboygan County, I can see that it's a part of the southeastern region. So, I can go down and click on the southeastern region, and all the resources are listed in the various counties, but since I'm from Sheboygan County, I can find Safe Harbor, and then sure enough, all of their contact information is there, as well as um, services, and that goes for all of the all of the resources listed will have like that contact information, the county, and then the services listed. 
Next, we have shared stories. So here in this section, youth can read the experiences of other victims, and if they choose to, they can share their own. All authors are anonymous, and every story shared is proofread to ensure that this resource is being used appropriately and safely. The purpose of this section is to let kids know that they are not alone and that there is a community ready to listen. Other features include a 24-hour domestic violence helpline that can be found in the upper right-hand corner. Next to the helpline, you'll find a quick exit where a child can click to quickly exit the site if for whatever reason, um, if someone's coming up behind them and they don't want um, someone to see that they're on the site for whatever reason, or um, if they're at home and they're afraid of someone seeing them on the site, um, they can click this quick exit and it will take them to the weather service and then you see that it turns their old tab just to Google. So there's really no way for someone to know that they were on the site. So let me just go back discoverlisten.com and then the very last feature is um, at the very bottom there is a contact form and this can be used if you have a question for anyone, children or um, adults, anyone um, can use this for questions, uh, sharing stories or information or contacting me about scheduling a presentation. I am in the process of scheduling more presentations, both public and private, so if any of you are part of a group or an organization that would be interested, please let me know. Um, this concludes the listen presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Judge Persick, for introducing that uh, very important and valued video. And please thank Chloe. I know she couldn't make it here tonight and tell her really she did a fabulous job on behalf of the board. So thank you. Okay, next we'll move on to uh, public addresses. We have none. Letters, communications, and announcements. We have a handful of resolutions. One is from Door County Board of Supervisors in support of revising and amending statutes related to court fees and costs in probate and juvenile court. I'll refer to, to the Law Committee. Next is a resolution from the Portage County Board of Supervisors in supporting local control for livestock siting. They'll be uh, referred to the Prey Committee. Uh, next is a resolution from Price County Board of Supervisors in support of increased funding for child protective services. Right, we received that before, so we received that for information. Next, uh, from Winnebago County, a resolution from the Board of Supervisors in support of increased funding again for child protective services. Once again, we'll receive that for information. And finally, a resolution from Winnebago County uh, in support of a national estuarine research reserve designation for Northeast Wisconsin. And we received that for information too as we saw that in March. So thank you. That's it. County Administrator's Report. Adam is going to pass on the County Administrator's Report because of the length of the video and the timeliness of that. So thank you. Consideration of committee. We were hoping there wouldn't be too much applause, <laughs> or at least, yeah, that's all right. Consideration of committee reports, executive committee. Resolution number six regarding approving standard intergovernmental agreement for 2020 county sales tax revenue sharing recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Gehring. Mr. Chairman, I move for adopt resolution number six. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Testrodi. Thank you, I'll uh, second the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Testrodi. Just a little information. This is the exact agreement that we've, uh, every year we've had to, uh, there's no changes in this from what we've done the last three years now, but there is one change that we're making going forward and we had promised the locals this. Uh, we had shared $1.5 million the first two years and this third year now it's going to be increased uh, to $1.6 million. 
So they'll divide a, a little bigger piece of the pie than they have in the past. So just for that information, which is what we had told them we would do as our numbers went up too. So, okay. Uh, any other que any questions on that or seeing no lights, uh, please push your I or nay button. Motions approved unanimously. Thank you. Consideration of committee reports, finance committee, resolution number five. Regarding authorizing creation of joint county library planning committee, recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for resolution number five. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Obler. Support that motion, sir. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, please push your aye or nay button. Motions also approved unanimously. Thank you. Turn the gavel over to the vice chair. Resolution number seven from the finance committee regarding disallowance of Brown claim against Sheboygan County. Resolution number seven will be referred to the executive committee. Ordinance is introduced, ordina ordinance number three from the executive committee. Regarding amending supervisor and county board chairperson compensation. Ordinance number three will be referred to the finance committee and ordinance number four from the transportation committee. Regarding designated all-terrain uh, vehicle routes and regulating the operation of all-terrain vehicles. Ordinance number four will be referred to a joint meeting of the Planning Resources, Agriculture and Extension Committee and the Law Committee. Final item is adjournment. Supervisor Bemis. I move we adjourn. Thank you, Supervisor Bemis. Supervisor Glavin. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Glavin. Please vote.